section 2.1, which is called something like first degree equations and inequalities in one variable. So first, degree equations and inequalities in one variable. Okay, so that's a lot of <coughs> a lot of talking, <laughs> a lot of words. Let's do an example. This is probably something this is probably something you've already seen. So let's do an example of what this means and then we'll get into some of those vocabulary words. An example will be three mm, X minus in parentheses five plus two times x minus one is equal to two x plus one. Okay, so here's an equation. Here's an equation. So then <coughs> there is a variable. So what is the variable? What symbol is the variable? E X, right? X is the variable in this equation, right? So then, for example, two, two is not a variable. Two is always equal to two, so it's said to be a constant, right? Or a coefficient. Okay, so then, <coughs> so, uh, you know, what we're trying to determine is that, you know, which values of X, which values of X give a legitimate solution? Which ones give a solution? So, for example, could you plug in zero? Right, would zero be okay? So here, here's a question. <coughs> Is x equal to zero a solution to this equation? Okay, I agree with no, but I need a, a reasoning. Okay, so I I agree with plugging in zero for x, but I don't I don't understand your last the last part of your statement. Ah, right. So then now, <coughs> most of you have seen most of you have seen, uh, you know the equal symbol before. So then how about this? Mm, one thing that you need to understand is this. How about this equation? Uh, no, we won't use zero, we'll use seven. Seven equal to seven. Is this true? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So that's an, e that's an example. Equations, right, equations themselves are objects which, which tell you yes. They say yes or no. They say true or false. So how about this equation? Three is equal to five. Is that a true equation? No, it's false. But nevertheless, it's an equation. It's still an equation. So my question to you, is x equal to 0 a solution to this equation? Okay, the way you determine if that's a fact is you plug in 0, and then you examine whether or not the equation is true. So then let's do that. Okay. Plug in x equal to 0 and examine. So if we do that, if we plug in x equal to 0, then we get 3 multiplied by 0 minus uh, 5 plus 2 multiplied by 0 minus 1. Where'd my, where'd the mouse go? Oh, here it is. 0 minus 1 <coughs> is equal to 2 times 0 plus 1. Okay, so now we just use arithmetic, the same arithmetic that we've always used. So this on the right-hand side, that's easy. So that's equal to 1 <coughs> on the right-hand side. As for the left-hand side, this is 0 minus, in parentheses, 5, and then 2 multiplied by 0 minus 1. What's 2 multiplied by 0 minus 1? Negative 2, right? So negative 2. Okay, <coughs> so then now, uh, I need to distribute this negative inside of the square parentheses, so I'll do it like this. I'll say, I'll, I'll do it like this. Negative uh, 3 is equal to 1, so negative 3 is equal to 1. So is that true? 
No, that's false. Right? That's false. So what's the conclusion about x equal to 0 being a solution? It's not. False. So x equal to 0 is not a solution. OK. So x equal to 0 is not a solution. So, you know, maybe we, the part of the question we're trying to ask is, well, is there any solution? Is there any solution? Maybe, maybe no matter what you plug in, it's always false. Or maybe, uh, maybe there's there there's one solution. I would say that this is not a good way to go about finding the solution, right? right? I said zero. Let's try zero. And then you, someone else might say, well, I like thirteen. Let's try thirteen. And then we just sit there and just just try forever and ever. So that's not a good way. That's not a good way. So <coughs> what we're going to do is we're just going to say, okay, well, I'm not going to plug in anything. I'm just going to try and and perform as many algebraic steps as I can, simplifying it, and see if I can just figure out what x is without guessing. Okay. <coughs> so then let's do that. So here's the equation. 3x minus, in parentheses, 5 plus 2x minus 1 is equal to 2x plus 1. Okay, so then let's simplify this <coughs> as much as we can. So 3x minus 5 plus 2x minus 2. Okay, so then what did I do? What's the name of the property that I used? Dis distributive property, right? I distributed the 2 in the into the x plus 1 parentheses. Okay, so then now inside of the square parentheses, I can get uh, 3 plus 2x. So now, now inside of the to the square parentheses, I need to, to distribute the negative. Right? So then what happens when I do that? I get 3x, and then I want to remove the parentheses. What happens? Minus 3, and then minus 2x. Okay, good. Equals 2x plus 1. Okay, so then now the left-hand side can be uh, simplified a little bit. Right, there is 3x minus 2x, so how much x? x? X, right? So then it will be x minus 3 is equal to 2x plus 1. Okay, so now, now we've exhausted, we've exhausted all of our, all of the things that we're used to, right? So what I mean to say is that this is, I know many of you have solved equations just like this before, right? But, you know, up until now, I've just been treating the left-hand side of the equation and the right-hand side of the equation as totally separate. Right? This will be the first time that I've done anything with an equation in this class. So, so what am I supposed to do from here? So who knows? What? Okay. Um, I agree. So then let's say it really carefully. I'll say this. This is an equation. You can do... You can maintain the truth or false, the truth, let's see, the truth value of the equation, true or false, if you do the same thing to both sides of the equation. So, I'm going to do what she said. I'm going to subtract x from both sides of the equation, right? So if I subtract it from the left side, if I subtract it from the left side, then I must also subtract it from the right side. Right? So if you do one thing to a side, you must do it to the, to the other side. Okay, so if you do that, then you get negative 3 is equal to 2x minus 1x is x plus 1. Okay, good, so now what? Okay, do, do what now? Right, I can subtract 1 from both sides. So I subtract 1 from both sides. Okay, so then negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4, and then 1 minus 1 is 0, so negative 4 is x. So have we figured out what x is? Well, normally if we, if we have something, if we know what, if we figured out what x is, then x should be on the left-hand side, but it's not on the left-hand side. It's on the right-hand side.
Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter, right? So then we're going to even see there's a name for that, the reason why it doesn't matter. Okay, so then the solution to this equation is x is negative 4. Okay, and according to this procedure, right, we did this in, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 6 steps. We did it in 6 steps. And all of these steps were legitimate mathematical steps. And therefore, we found this solution, and apparently this is the only solution. This is the only solution. So how could you verify that this, in fact, is a solution? You plug it in. So then let's check and make sure that it's true, because if you have an equation, if you're claiming that x equal to negative 4 is a solution, you better be able to plug it in, and you better get a true equation at the end. Okay, so then let's check. Okay, <coughs> so then 3 times negative 4 minus 5 plus 2 times negative 4 minus 1. <coughs> this goes to equal to 2 times negative 4 plus 1. Okay, so then that will be negative 12 minus, so 2 times negative 5 is negative 10, so 5 minus is equal to negative 8 plus 1. <coughs> negative 8 plus 1. So then uh, negative 12 minus negative 5 equal to negative 7. Okay, so then the left-hand side, negative 12 minus negative 5, that's the same as negative 12 plus 5 is equal to negative 7. Okay, so then negative 12 plus 5 is negative 7, equal to negative 7. So is that true? Ah, so then we must have, we must have done it properly. It is a fact. Negative 4 is the solution to the equation. So, <coughs> that's true. Okay. So any question <coughs> any question about the opening example? The opening example. <coughs> okay, so then now all of these things here. Okay, all of these equations, right? There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight equations all right here. All of these equations are said to be equivalent. Okay, they're equivalent because th their solutions, their x solutions, are all the same. Right? We change them around. Right? They're not the same equation. They're not identical, but they're equivalent. <coughs> okay. So, any question about about this? Okay. So now let's go over what just what can you do with an equation. Okay, so if we are given real numbers A, B, and C. Okay, so if we have three real numbers. <coughs> so if A is equal to B, then the following things are true. One, A plus C is equal to B plus C. Okay, that means that if you, have, if you have an equation, if you have an equation, then you can add something to both sides, any number that you want. And because you can add something to both sides, you can subtract something because you can think of that just as adding an, the additive inverse. Add negative 7 to both sides instead of subtracting x and c both sides. Okay, so you can add things to both sides. Okay, 2. AC is equal to AC, uh, BC. AC is equal to BC. 
However, I'll make a note here. <coughs> I'll make an important note here. Is that <coughs> this equation is true. Okay, this equation is true. So if A is equal to B, <coughs> then you could you then you can multiply both sides by C. However, If C is equal to 0, then the two equations may not be equivalent. So what does this mean? This means that okay, you can multiply both sides of an equation by a number. And that's a legitimate thing to do. However, in practice, you should never multiply both sides of an equation by what? By zero. Right? If you multiply both sides of an equation by zero, then you have then you have possibly changed, uh, come up with a new equation that's not equivalent to the one that you had previously. So you know, I can tell you a story, a story, recurring story from my life, and that is that, you know, in my family, I'm anomalous. Right? I'm the only math person in my family. Everybody else is in construction. And, uh, you know, all of the time they walk up to me and they say, okay, Grady, what is uh, 437 million and, and 7 multiplied by some other ridiculous number? And I just, I have, I have no idea. You know? <laughs> I don't know what that number is. And then the other thing that I hear all the time is, right, they send me the, the picture where they say, you know, you have a sequence of algebraic operations. And then, you know, they, they determine that, so 2 is equal to 1. Uh, probably if you've spent any time on Facebook or whatever, you've seen that, where there's a sequence of algebraic operations and they determine that 2 is equal to 1 and 1 is equal to 0. What do you suppose happens in that sequence of algebraic operations? They took an equation and did this. They multiplied by, by 0. They multiplied both sides of the equation by 0. That's what happened. Okay, they started out with a true equation and then multiplied both sides by zero and turned it into a false equation and then went on from there. Okay, so then <coughs> next time that comes up, try and find the try and find the error in that computation. Okay, so then <coughs> so then similarly, right, just for completeness, you could say A minus C is B minus C. Okay, and also A divided by C is equal to B divided by C, and this is definitely when when what when C is not zero. <coughs> okay. So, any question about these things? Any question about these things? Okay. So now we're going to solve some equations. Try and choose a representative sample. Okay, that looks <coughs> boring, so let's do this one. 3 over x minus 1, 3 over x minus 1 pl plus 5 is equal to the right hand side, which is 4 minus x over x minus 1. Okay, so then what we want to do is we want to find an x value find an x value that yields a true equation that yields a true uh, a, a, an equation that evaluates the true okay so then i have a question for you before we get anywhere and that is um, what x value is certainly not a solution to this equation 1 uh, pro maybe not 0 either i don't know but but from inspection why can 1 not be a solution? Right, because you cannot evaluate the left-hand side or the right-hand side of this equation at 1. Right, so this equation, a solution is not 1. Right, so then note, x equal to 1 cannot be a solution. equal to 1 cannot be a solution. 
okay, now, now that we have made that note, now that we have made that note, let's go about this and solve this equation. So, what do you want to do? How do you want to go about this? Okay, so you're saying that we should find a common denominator? Okay, so then 3 over x minus 1 plus 5 multiplied by x minus 1 over x minus 1, is this what you had in mind? Okay, is equal to 4 minus x over x minus 1. Okay, good. So then 3 over x minus 1 plus 5x minus 5 over x minus 1 is equal to 4 minus x over x minus 1. Okay, so I found a common denominator. Now what would you like? Combine, okay. So then uh, if we do that, then 5x and then plus 3 minus 5. So 5x minus 2 divided by x minus 1 is equal to 4 minus x divided by x minus 1, okay? So, so far we've done good. We've sort of avoided the whole fact that this is an equation because <laughs> we haven't done anything that, that uses the fact that it's an equation. So now what? Okay, so then I agree with that, but you need to, you need to, you need to illustrate, demonstrate what is the intermediate operation that lets you say that. Okay, so what he said was the numerators, we need to set the numerators to be equal to each other. I agree that eventually that has to happen, but there has to be an intermediate step that occurs. What intermediate step? Okay, so the intermediate step is this. The intermediate step is, okay, first I'll copy this down. So first, that's just a copy. So then I want the denominators to go away. So note that if I was to multiply the right-hand side by x minus 1, then the denominator of the right-hand side would go away. But you can't just multiply the right-hand side by something. right? That's not legal. You can't just do that. So if I multiply the right-hand side by something, what else must I do? Multiply the left-hand side by the same something. Okay. So then uh, x minus 1. Okay, so I multiplied the left-hand side by x minus 1. I multiplied the right-hand side by x minus 1. Excellent. Okay, so then you should see now that the denominator, the no denominators will cancel on both sides so that we obtain 5x minus 2 is equal to 4 minus x. Okay, so now what? Okay. So we'll add x to both sides. Okay, so then I get 6x minus 2 is equal to 4. Okay, so then probably add 2 to both sides. Okay, so those of you are that are at the end of the, of the, of the problem, right, so then start thinking about what I'm going to add. 6x is equal to 6. Okay, so now what? Okay, now I can divide by 6. I divide by 6, divide by 6. Then 6x over 6 is 1x, and then 6 over 6 is 1. Okay, so here's an interesting question. Tell me about the solutions to this equation. Zero. There are no solutions to this equation. There are no solutions to this equation. Now, that's kind of disturbing, I'm sure. Right? So you're probably accustomed to, well, every equation should have a solution. Right? No. No, not every equation, equation needs to have a solution. Certainly not. 
Okay, so then that was the very first thing we said at the very top. X equal to 1 cannot be a solution. It cannot be a solution. So then, <coughs> what this is telling us is that there are no solutions to this equation. And that is a perfectly legitimate situation to be in. No solutions. Okay, so then the previous equation had how many solutions? In the previous example, I mean, had one solution, right? This equation had had no solution, no solution. So now I have a question for you. I have a question for you. <coughs> so then, this this part that I'm highlighting in blue, or boxing in blue, or whatever it is that I'm doing here. So if you ignore everything except the only thing that I want. Does that help you out? Yeah? You ever remind me when I forget to do something? Okay, so the the part of the computation that I boxed in blue, if you ignore everything else except the part of the computation that I boxed in blue, then x equal to 1 is a solution, right? Because everything that's boxed in blue, all of those are equivalent equations. They're all equivalent. So what happened, right? I started, I started with the first equation that's at the top. So what happened? When did the equations become not equivalent anymore? When I multiplied both sides by x minus 1, right? That's what happened. Okay, so you can see all of the equations, all of these ones in the top, the top half, they're all equivalent. In the bottom half, the bottom half of the equations are not equivalent to the top half of the equations. So the change happened when I multiplied by x minus 1 on both sides. So what happened? What happened? So I just, I, about 5, 10 minutes ago, I said that if you do something, you may switch to a non-equivalent equation. You may go from one equation to another equation and the two are not equivalent. So then what happens? X minus one is actually equal to zero. Right? X minus one was zero, so it's like those, those terms in red, that's what happened here. Okay, so then this, <coughs> this thing, right, these, these operations, these are the kinds of things I'm going to, to quiz you over. Right, not today. So then you need to be able to, to, to look at an equation and say, ah, well, I can see that, that that x value and that x value and that x value, none of those can be solutions. None of those are solutions. And then you go through a sequence of operations and then you come to the end and you say, ah, okay, well, x equal to 1, that was one of the illegal solutions, so that's not a solution. Okay, so there, there may be no solution. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, good. Another example. <coughs> Another example. Yeah, this one will be great. Okay, <laughs> so eight, eight divided by x minus five. Eight divided by x minus five minus five over x plus three. Okay, is equal to. 3x plus 49 in the numerator, and then the denominator, x squared minus 2x minus 15. Okay. So, the first thing you should do when you when I give you an equation and I and the instruction is to solve, you need to you need to immediately say what cannot be a solution. What cannot be a solution? So what certainly cannot be a solution? Five and negative three cannot be solutions. Why not? Because you cannot plug them into the equation. It is illegal. If you attempt to plug in five, then the left hand side is undefined. If you attempt to plug in negative 3, then the left-hand side is undefined. So x equal to 5 
and x equal to negative 3 are not solutions. Okay, but before we get any further, we should still check because, you know, that thing, the denominator of the right-hand side, denominator of the right-hand side, may also have some x values that when you plug in, you get 0. May also have some of those. Okay, so then how do we determine that? by factoring. Okay, so then let's do that. So let's factor x squared minus 2x minus 15. Okay, so then we're still in the guess, more or less in the guess and check factoring stage. So we're hoping that it factors into, you know, one term multiplied by another term like the, the product of two binomials. Okay, so then what should be leading here in each one of these? x, right? x and x. And so we're thinking that that should be leading like that because the product of x and x is x squared. Okay, so then now we have negative 15. So what, what are, how does negative 15 factor? 3 and 5. Okay, so then I'll put a 3 and a 5 here. Okay, but, you know, we don't know if it should be plus 3, minus 3, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So how shall it be? plus 3, minus 5. Okay, so does, it, does everyone agree? Okay, so then, you know, when you get good at this, you know, you can do this in your head, but if you're not good at it yet, how can you verify that this is correct? Multiply it back out, right? So I'll just do that real quick. So then if you FOIL this back out, you get x squared uh, plus 3x minus 5x minus 15, which is x squared minus 2x minus 15. So is that right? Ah, that's it. We're good. Okay, so I'll rewrite the equation and get 8 over x minus 5 minus 5 over x plus 3 equal to 3x plus 49 divided by x plus 3 multiplied by x minus 5. Okay, so according to that, according to the right-hand side, now what also is not a solution? Negative 3 and positive 5. Okay, so the same ones as the left-hand side. Okay, so we didn't pick up any new ones. Okay, so now that we have carefully gone through and determined what cannot possibly be a solution, now we need to start with our algebraic operation, so someone please describe to me how shall we go about doing this. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what... Okay, common denominator. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so then let's find a common denominator. So then 8 over, so x minus 5. So what, what's missing for this first term? Right, x plus 3. So then I'll say x plus 3 divided by x plus 3. Okay, then minus 5 over x plus 3, like so. And then this one's missing x minus 5, so x minus 5 over x minus 5. Okay, equal to three x plus forty-nine x plus three x minus five. Okay. So then I'll carry this out a little bit further. <coughs> so I get what? Eight x eight x plus twenty-four over x minus five times x plus three minus 5x minus 25 over x plus 3, x minus 1, for the left-hand side, is equal to 3x plus 49, x plus 3, x minus 5. Okay. So now what? Combine, okay? 
the left hand side. Okay, so then I'm going to make a subtle error on the left hand side. So I'll say that, okay, this is all going to be over a common denominator. It's all going to be over the common denominator x plus 3 multiplied by x minus 5. So it's all over that denominator. And I'll say that it's 8x plus 24 minus 5x minus 25 equal to 3x plus 49 over x plus 3 times x minus 5. Okay, so I've made an error. What error have I made? Ah, I didn't distribute the negative because because look at what this is saying, this thing I'm boxing in red. I'm supposed to subtract all of this, right? I have to subtract that whole term. The whole term has to be subtracted. Not just the first term that was written, but all of the terms, right? So then it's minus all of this, minus all of that. So then there was a parentheses error, a distribution error. Nevertheless, I find that, even though it's sort of obvious now that I've mentioned it, nevertheless, I observe this error a lot in the responses from students. Okay, so then, <coughs> so then, 8x minus 5x, well, that's 3x, oops, 3x, okay, and then 24 minus negative 25, that's 24 plus 25, and what's that? 49. So 3x plus 49 over x plus 3x minus 5 is equal to 3x plus 49 x plus 3 x minus 5. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So now what? I can multiply both sides of the equation by something. By what? Yeah, so I'll do that. And then I'll use my lovely computer here instead of copy paste. <coughs> Oops, not that. Okay, so I can multiply both sides of the equation by x plus 3 multiplied by x minus 5. That has the nice effect, the nice effect of canceling the denominators of both sides. So then uh, on the left-hand side, I get 3x plus 49. And on the right-hand side, I get 3x plus 49. And then I could subtract 3x from both sides. I subtract 3x from both sides and obtain the following equation, 49 is equal to 49. So how about that equation? This equation is true. Does it depend on what x value it is? You know, what about when uh, x is equal to um, 10? Is it true when x is 10? Sure. Is it true when it's sunny outside? Yeah, what about when it's raining? Right? It's always true. Right? This is just a true equation. However, so my question for you is, is what values of x are actually solutions to the original equation? What values of x? So it may, for those of you that, are, that think you know the answer and are being silent, you may actually be wrong. Okay, so go ahead and give it to me. What, what, uh, what are the solutions to this equation? Okay, one and zero. Yeah, those are s those are solutions. Sorry. There it is, right? So then you may, every x is a solution to the last equation, right? 49 is 49. That's true for any value of x, any value of x at all. Okay, but I didn't ask you, I didn't ask you about 49 is equal to 49. I asked you about this equation, the opening equation. So any value of x that you plug in to this equation that is legal to plug into this equation is a solution. 
So is everything legal? No. Re buy the negative three are not solutions. So then the answer to this, to, to this question is that all x except x equal to 5 and x equal to negative 3 are solutions. All x are solutions except those two. So this one has a lot of solutions, right? <laughs> so the first, so now we've done three equations. Right? The first one had exactly, exactly one solution, and its solution was x is negative 4. The second equation that we solved had how many solutions? None. It had none solutions, right? The second, the, the second equation, right? Uh, we opened up and said, well, the second equation, one cannot be a solution. And then we went through a sequence of operations and we said that, well, the only, the only solution could be one, right? It, it could possibly be if one. And then we said, okay, well, so if one can't be a solution, and the only solution could be one, then there's no solution at all. So there were zero solutions to the second equation. And then this, this example, there were infinitely many solutions. Infinitely many, lots and lots of them. So this is generally what's going to happen in this section, is you're always going to fall into one of those cases. There's going to be exactly zero solutions. There's going to be exactly one solution. Or there's going to be infinitely many solutions. <coughs> so any question about this one? No question. Okay, so then now let's do a little more. Okay, so how about how about we consider this y y is equal to x minus one. Y is equal to x minus one over two x plus three. Two x plus 3. Okay, and the instruction is solve for x. So that's kind of weird. There's a y in there. Solve for x. What should we do? What should we do? Okay, <coughs> I heard something that sounded like multiply. I agree. But what? Right, if we multiply both sides of this equation by 2x plus 3... that has the nice effect that it makes uh, this equation not have a fraction anymore. So then the left hand side, <coughs> the left hand side becomes 2x plus 3 multiplied by y is equal to x minus 1. Okay, so that's a little bit better. So we're trying to solve for x. We're trying to solve for x. And we currently are in the situation where there are x's on the left-hand side of the equation, and there are also x's on the right-hand side of the equation. So there's nothing uh, special about the left or the right side. But what we want is we want all of the x's to be on the same side. Right? It, they can all be on the left. They can all be on the right, whichever. It doesn't matter. Okay, so then let's go about and make that happen. So the first step is I'll distribute the product that is on the left hand side to get 2xy plus 3y is equal to x minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to, you can see that this term right here, 2xy, that has an x in it. How about 3y? Is there any x in there? No, there's no, there's no x in there. So now we're going to start doing the following kind of thing. 
because it's a, a helpful algebraic trick. Okay, so then in a sense, what I want is I want to move the 3y to the other side. Right, that's what I want. The way we've been doing this previously is we've been saying, well, I'm going to subtract 3y from both sides. The effect, right, with your eye is what you want to see is you want to see the 3y on the other side. Right, so in a sense, I want to do this. So what happens when you move a term from one side to the other? What happens to it? It changes its sign. Right? It, on the left-hand side, it's positive 3y. On the right-hand side, it's negative 3y. Okay, so then similarly, similarly, we want this x to be where? On the left-hand side. It's currently on the right. We want it to be on the left. So again, moving it to the left has the result of changing its sign. Okay, so then after doing that, then you get 2xy minus x is equal to negative 3y minus 1. So any question on how we achieve that? Okay, so we want to solve for x. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. So now what? Sorry? Uh, where would I move it? I'm not sure what you mean, honestly. Sorry? So, trying to solve for x. Trying to solve for x. So there's too many copies of x here. I want to somehow rep I want to represent the left hand side with just one x. Right? I have it written on the left hand side twice. I have a two x y and then minus x. So what I want to do is I want to factor the left hand side. So can you see a common factor in the left hand side? X, right? x is common. So you can say that this is x multiplied by what? 2y and then what? Minus 1. Okay. Okay, so now I, I'm starting to get x nearly by itself now. So now what can I do? Okay, good. Divide. Divide by what? Right. I can divide by 2y minus 1. So if I do that, then I get x, x is equal to negative 3y minus 1 over 2y minus 1. And there it is, right? We did it. We solved for x. Excellent. So any question about this example? Any question about it? Okay, so one more. To sort of illustrate the the features of this. So does everybody have as much of this as they want to see? <laughs> I know I do. Okay. <coughs> so now for those of you that have taken physics or are planning on taking physics and that kind of thing, then eventually you'll need to study electricity and magnetism. Okay. And then, you know, in this computer and this device and all of the devices in here, uh, there are various electrical components. A very important electrical component that's used everywhere is called a resistor. A resistor. So then <coughs> what a resistor does is when electricity is flowing through a wire, when electricity is flowing through a wire, so literally what's happening is electrons are traveling through the wire. How fast are electrons traveling through the wire? This is a trick question. How fast are they traveling through the wire? So how about this? Are electrons traveling quickly or slowly? Uh, you would think quickly, but in fact, electrons are actually traveling really slowly, actually. That'll be something interesting if you go on and take uh, electricity and magnetism and physics. You'll find out that the electrons are actually only traveling a few millimeters per second. That's it. You could walk faster than the electrons are traveling through the wire. The electricity, right, the current is traveling at the speed of light really fast. You can't, you can't go that fast. But you can travel faster than the electrons are going. Okay, at any rate, what a resistor is, what a resistor is, is it something that, that uh, you know, you, you take two pieces of wire and you want to you join them together and you put this device in between them 
and this device in between them, the electrons travel more slowly through this device than they do through the wire. So it's said to resist the flow of electrons. Okay, so it's called a resistor. So then, you know, you can wire up things variously, okay, and when you're trying to compute the total resistance of a circuit, which is something that you will do in physics, or you may have already done if you guys have already taken physics, if you want to find the total resistance, okay, of the total resistance, of two resistors, R1 and R2 wired in parallel, is R, which is given by 1 over R, over R is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Okay, so this is a this is something that if you've taken electricity and magnetism, you've seen this. If you haven't, then you probably will see it soon. So suppose this is a typical kind of question that's in a physics class. They'll tell you, okay, okay. Uh, Let's measure the total resistance of this circuit so that you can figure out R. You can figure out R. And then they say, you know the resistance of the first resistor. It's known to have, you know, 10 ohms of resistance. Its resistance is 10 ohms. But we don't know the resistance of the second resistor. Right? So you have to figure out the second resistance. So what does that mean algebraically? What would that mean algebraically? If you know the total resistance of the circuit and you know the resistance of the first resistor but not the second one, how could you figure out the resistance of the second one? By solving, right? So then, you know, I've sort of put you through this hypothetical situation where you know R and you know this one, right? You know the two red ones. And in this hypothetical physics problem, you're supposed to figure out the green one. Okay, so algebraically, algebraically, this means solve for R2. So suppose you know R and R1. Determine R2. <coughs> Determine R2. Okay, so algebraically, That means solve for R2. Okay. So 1 over R is equal to 1 over R1 uh, minus uh, plus 1 over R2. So first, first thing is that we want to get R2 as by itself as possible. We want it to be by itself. Okay, so then, you know, that's sort of a loose way to say it, but I, I'll say it like this. R2 is not by itself because it's not the only thing that's on the right-hand side of the equation. And so what I'm suggesting is that we should move this term to the other side. So what is the effect of moving that term from, the, from one side to the other? It changes its sign. Okay. <coughs> So then if we do that, we get 1 over R minus 1 over R1 is equal to 1 over R2. Okay. So that's almost it, right? We don't, we want to solve for R2. We don't want to solve for 1 over R2. So in a sense, right, we need to, you know, we need the reciprocal of the right-hand side. We don't need 1 over R2. We need R2. So what can we do? Ah, oh, we can take reciprocals of both sides, right? So then <coughs> what that means is that, you know, you could go through a sequence of, of operations where you, multi you multiply bo both sides of the equation by the reciprocal of the right-hand side, and you multiply both sides of the equation by the reciprocal of the left-hand side, 
and then you have all of this cancellation, and the net result is that we'll take the reciprocals on both sides. Okay, so the reciprocal is, is this. So what is the reciprocal of the right-hand side? Okay, so am I, is reciprocal a word that's not familiar? I don't know. The right-hand side, right? I'm asking for the easy side first. It's just R2. Okay, good. Okay, so then as for the left-hand side, its reciprocal is 1 over 1, uh, 1 over 1 over R minus 1 over R1. Okay, like so. And this is the solution to this problem. Okay, so then, you know, there's probably a physics lab running this R2 running this summer. I would guess that, you know, this is like the third week or whatever of the main semester. Students are probably doing this this week. <laughs> or maybe they did it last week. You know, something just like this. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay. So any questions about anything before we continue? <laughs> any questions? <coughs> Okay, so here's a nice. <laughs> Everybody, be careful. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna read a problem aloud. Are you okay? <laughs> okay, <coughs> so you know, besides these purely uh, symbolic problems that I've given you, right? I can give you word problems, right? This is a legitimate thing. So I'm gonna read a word problem aloud. A computer. <coughs> Excuse me. A computer discount store held an end of summer sale on two types of computers. On two types of computers. So you can imagine that they have, you know, uh, like a, a budget computer and an expensive computer. So they have two different computers, one that's expensive and one that's less expensive. Kay. They collected $41,800 on the sale of 58 computers. So they sold 58 computers altogether. The one type of computer sold for 600 and the other type sold for 850. So you can see one of them is, expen is more expensive than the other. Okay, so then we want to determine how, m how many of each type of computer was sold. Okay, so then <coughs> let's, I'll write down the salient fact. Okay, so two types of computers were sold. That's the first fact. The second fact, <coughs> the second fact is that 58 computers were sold. Which means that, you know, maybe maybe there were 50 of the cheap ones sold and 8 of the expensive ones sold. Or something like that, but we're not going to do that. We're going to we're not in that part of the semester yet. Okay, so then $41,800 $41, of computers were sold. <coughs> okay, and for the two types cost 600 and 850 respectively. Okay, so those are the salient facts <coughs> about the question. So then, for those of you that have taken a, a course like college algebra be before, normally what we would do is we would use a system of equations and things like that. But system of equations is an illegal phrase currently at this station. <laughs> semester, so then I'm going to avoid saying that. 
So then I'm going to avoid using a system of equations and just try and figure out the rest. Okay, so then let's say, let's call x the number, the quantity of $600 computers. So we sold, we're going to call that, we sold X of them. Okay. Then the quantity, quantity of 850 dollar computers. sold is, you should be able to tell me exactly how many there are now in terms of X. So we sold X $600 computers. So how many 850 ones did we sell? 58 minus X, right? Because if we sold X of the cheap ones, okay, and we sold 58 computers altogether, then 58 Minus x plus x is 58. So then that's how many expensive ones we must have sold. Okay. Now, <coughs> finally, we can come up with an equation. We need to use this total, total sales, 41,800. Okay. So then we can say that 41,800 has to be equal to what? Six hundred times x. Why six hundred times x? Right, because we sold x, a quantity x of the six hundred dollar computers. Right, so that's how much money was derived from the six hundred dollar computers, the six hundred x. And then what else? Okay, plus fifty eight minus x. That's how many $850 computers we sold, and then what? Times 850. Times 850. So this, right, this is total sales. This, right, quantity, is sales from the $600 computers. Okay, and this is the sales from the $850 computers. Okay? So, the sum of those two, that should be the total sales. Okay, so any question about how we sort of turn this word problem into an algebraic problem. So now the instruction is, okay, we're supposed to figure out how many, how many of each one did we sell. So what does that mean? What is the, al what is the algebraic instruction? Right, the, the linguistic instruction was determine the number of computers we sold. Algebraically, now you are supposed to solve for x. Okay, good. So <coughs> let's do that. So, 41800 is 600x, and then minus, uh, we'll say plus first. Okay, so 58, oh my goodness, what is that? Okay, so don't worry, I, you won't be allowed to use calculators, but I, I won't give you anything that requires a calculator. I consider this to require a calculator. Okay, so 58. No, that couldn't be right. Unless we type something out. It's 5, 8 times 8, 5, 8, 0. Okay, so 4, 9, 3, 0, 0.
Okay. <coughs> and then minus uh, 850 x. Okay. So <coughs> this will be 41800 is equal to 600 x minus minus 850 x so that's negative negative 250 x plus 49300 zero, zero. okay so I'll move the 250 x to the left hand side 250 x to the left hand side and I'll move the 41,800 to the right hand side and get 49300 zero, zero minus 41800 zero, zero. Two fifty x is equal to seven five zero zero. <coughs> okay, so now what? Divide both sides by what? By two fifty. So then x is equal to 7500 zero zero over 250. Zero. So then first you, can, you should be able to see that, well, I can cancel the zero, so that's 750 over 25. Okay, so then 75 over 25 is 3, and then with the zero behind it is 30. So, so what does this mean? So this is a word problem, so you need, you need a, a sentence as a summary. So we algebraically did this. We determined that x is 30. What does x is 30 mean? Yes, so 30 $600 computers were sold. And And 28, right, and 58 uh, minus 30 equal to 28, $850 computers were sold. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, so word problems, all that kind of stuff. Any question about these things before we get to inequalities? So inequalities are a little bit more, um, they have a little bit more interest to them. They're a little bit more slippery. Okay, so now we're going to do inequalities. So suppose that A B and C are real numbers. So, you know, real numbers, that's a mathematician's phrase. So remind me, what does it mean, real numbers? Not, not imaginary, right? So the, 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 the whole real thing, the adjective real is a math sort of a mathematician's joke, right? We're talking about real numbers instead of the, the ones that the physicists were insisting on calling imaginary. <coughs> okay. So suppose that you have real numbers, A, B, and C. If A is less than B, then we have the following properties. Then we have the following properties. Then A plus C is less than b plus c. So that means that you can, if you have an inequality, then you can add something to both sides. That's perfectly legitimate thing to do. Okay, similarly, right, if you can add, then you can subtract. Perfectly legitimate. 
Right, so these two properties, adding something, the same something to both sides and subtracting the same something from both sides. So equalities and inequalities work exactly the same in this, in this manner. <coughs> However, now things start getting a little different. Okay, so then I'm going to group these together. Three. <coughs> you can multiply... both sides by C. But there are two possibilities now. Let's put them like that. Okay, so then <coughs> if C is positive, then AC is less than BC. Okay, so then that's just like, that's just like, uh, you know, behaving like inequality. But now, if, if C is negative, then we'll still have, on the left-hand side, AC, and on the right-hand side, BC. But what? Ah, but the inequality switches its direction. Right? So then so then you know, look at these careful carefully. Right? Notice that this, right, we started out we started out with it pointing to the left, right? With less than. Right? Less than. Less than. So less than is preserved if you multiply by a positive number. If you multiply by a negative number, then it switches, right? It switches its direction. Okay, the same story is true. The same story is true for division. So if C is positive, then A over C is less than B over C. If C is negative, then A over C is greater than B over C. Okay, <coughs> and then finally, the last property is that if A and B are both non zero. which is to say that neither one of them is zero, then if we have A is less than B, what happens if we take reciprocals of both signs? That is to say that we switch A to 1 over A, and we switch B to 1 over B. Right, so we've taken reciprocals of both sides, then what happens to the direction of the inequality? It changes. So there are a few cases, right? There are a few cases where the direction of the inequality is going to change. Okay, you need to you need to watch these <coughs> very carefully. Okay, so any question about this example or these these instructions? Yeah. <coughs> okay. So, for example. Start out with a simple one, <coughs> relatively simple. So 5x plus 8, parentheses, 20 uh, minus x greater than or equal to 2 multiplied by x minus 5. Okay, so the instruction is that I want you to solve for x. Okay, so then now, <coughs> this is going to feel just like solving equations for x, except now you're using this other symbol, and when it comes to multiplying or dividing, now you need to very carefully check whether or not, 
uh, you're multiplying by something positive or something negative. Okay, because if you're multiplying by something or dividing by something negative, then the direction of the inequality changes. Okay. So then 5x plus uh, what? 160 minus 8x greater than or equal to 2x minus 10. Okay, so then I'll simplify the left hand side and get negative 3x plus 160 greater than or equal to 2x minus 10. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so then uh, I want to get all of the x's, <coughs> everything with x to one side, everything without x to the other side. Okay, so then I'll move these negative 3x's to the right hand side and I'll move these 10 units to the other side <coughs> and get that 170 is greater than or equal to uh, 5x <coughs> okay then I'll divide by 5 so I'm going to divide by 5 do I need to switch the direction of the inequality sorry right 5 is positive so we're in we're in good shape so over 5 over 5 so then 170 over 5 is 20 plus 14, 34, <coughs> is that right? Yeah. 34 greater than or equal to x. Okay, so then it's common, not required as far as I'm concerned, but it's common to write it like this. x is less than or equal to 34. So any question about this example? So, hmm. <coughs> how about this? So, do you remember, or have you heard, right, that there are multiple ways to measure the temperature, right? Multiple scales with which to measure the temperature. So, you know, in the United States, we use uh, Fahrenheit typically when we're talking normally amongst ourselves. Right, so then that's, you know, that works pretty good because it's sort of nice because the Fahrenheit temperature scale between 0 and 100 is basically the range of temperatures that humans would find acceptable, right? Z anything below 0 is essentially, below 0 Fahrenheit is essentially unacceptable, right? That's too cold. And then anything over 100 Fahrenheit is too hot. Right, so then it's sort of a very used to this, but you know, there's another temperature scale that arguably is better for science because it's in wider usage and all of that, and it's called what? The Celsius scale or the centigrade scale. Okay, so then, <coughs> so then, <coughs> if you wanted to convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit, if you wanted to convert between Celsius, Celsius and Fahrenheit, then you could take. So given a Fahrenheit, I'm not sure how to spell Fahrenheit. I'll spell it like that, and then I'll remind you that I'm a math major, that, and when I have a spell checker, I use it. Okay, so given a Fahrenheit temperature F, given a Fahrenheit temperature F, The corresponding Celsius temperature is C is equal to F minus 32, and then you take that and multiply it by 5 over 9. So that's interesting. <coughs> that's interesting. So I could say, you know, we could say that, well, what is... Uh, what is boiling in the Fahrenheit scale? So what's boiling? Water boiling. In Fahrenheit. Oh, come now. <laughs> 212, right? 212 degrees Fahrenheit is boiling. 
by that standard temperature and, and pressure. So then the boiling point of water in the Fahrenheit scale is 212. <coughs> so you further should probably know from memory what is the boiling point of water in the Celsius scale? 100. 100. So let's check and see if that's true. So then C, C is equal to 5 ninths. Okay, and then I'll plug in 212, so 212 minus 32. Okay, so let's plug this in very carefully. <coughs> so C is equal to 5 ninths, and then 212 minus 32 is what? I'll do it like this, right? 5 multiplied by 180 over 9. Okay, what's 180 over 9? 20. So C is 5 times 20. Okay, so then what's C? 100, right? Okay, good, right? Verified. <laughs> now our suspicion is confirmed. <coughs> okay. So now let's do something, a computation that's similar to this. A computation that's similar to this. So let's say this. The, the range of temperatures, right, zero, less than C, less than 100. Right, this reason right here, this is the reason why the Celsius scale is used, right, because everyone has access to water. Every scientist has access to water, and if you purify the water, then on the Celsius scale, water will freeze at what temperature? Zero. And it will boil at what temperature? 100, right? So then, you know, the Fahrenheit scale is sort of tuned to human beings, right? Zero is, we're not going any colder than zero. <laughs> if it's colder than zero where I'm living, I'm moving. <laughs> or whatever. So then Fahrenheit is sort of tuned to humans. Between 0 and 100 is about the reasonable scale for humans. Okay, and then, you know, 0 to 100 on the Celsius scale is what water does, right? Water freezes at 0, boils at 100. Okay, so then now, <coughs> let's use, let's plug this in here. Let's plug this in and say that, okay, 0 is less than or equal to 5 ninths. F minus 32 is less than or equal to 100. And now I want you to solve for F. Solve for F. So I, what I'm saying is I want you to isolate F. So then this, this right here that I'm st starring, all right, this is the actual question. The actual inequality is, here's this inequality I want you to solve for F. All this stuff leading up to it, I'm trying to get you psychologically involved in the question. <laughs> so that we actually have something going. Okay. So what can I do? Multiply. Okay, multiply by what? Nine over five. Okay, so then, so then I agree. This is a good thing to consider. Multiply nine over five. But now this is kind of weird, right? Because now, now there's two inequality symbols, right? Previously we we were just dealing with one inequality symbol, and now we have two. So if I'm going to multiply, you know, where where do I need to multiply by? So like when you have an equation, there's like a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And when you multiply, you have to multiply both sides by the same quantity. Well, what about this? Okay, not, not both, right? Both not, is not the right word choice. So all, right? Maybe all is there, right? Both means two. There's three positions in this inequality, right? The left and the middle and the right. So then we're going to multiply by something. You have to multiply all positions multiply all positions by the same thing. Okay, so then it will have this appearance. Zero less than or equal to uh, 
five nine f minus thirty two f minus fifty one hundred. Okay, so then <coughs> specifically, you know, five nine or no nine fifths multiplied by the left, nine fifths multiplied by the middle, nine fifths multiplied by the right. Okay, so what was the purpose of, of performing that multiplication? So that the middle would be simpler, right? So that the middle would be simpler. Okay, so then 9 fifths times 0 is what? So first off, we're multiplying by something. Every time you multiply something, you need to check. Has the direction, does the direction of the inequality need to change? So does it? No, why not? Because it's not negative. It's a positive. Okay, so then 9 fifths. Uh, times zero is zero, less than or equal to nine fifths times five ninths is one, right? That's why we wanted to do that. So then f minus thirty two is less than or equal to so nine fifths times one hundred is what? Is well I'll do it like this, right? So then so then I could divide by five, right? So one hundred over five is is 20, so it'll be 9 times 20, whatever that is. <coughs> okay, so then it'll be 0 is less than or equal to f minus 32 is less than or equal to 180. <coughs> okay, so now how can I isolate f? Okay, good. So then from all positions, to all positions, I will add 32. Okay, so then 32 less than or equal to F less than or equal to 212. Okay, so that's interesting, right? So then this is just sort of an algebraic right, inspection of something that you probably already knew. So these, e these two equations are, these two inequalities are equivalent to each other, logically, right? This one is talking about, the first one is the range of Fahrenheit temperatures where water is a liquid. <coughs> and the second one is the range of Celsius temperatures where water is a liquid. So any question about this? Okay, so now I have another question for you. I want you to write I want you to write this thing in interval notation. Right? Not not a graph, not a number line, but an interval notation. So do you know the phrase interval notation? That is where you use either square parentheses or round parentheses. So how will you write it? in interval notation, right? So then 32, why am I using a square parenthesis here? Because it's included, because it's included. Okay, and then what? 212, good. And then similarly, this one will be 0, 100. Great. Any questions about this? <coughs> okay. <coughs> Okay, so I have 1034. When I have 1040, uh, we'll begin again. So let your brain unwind for.